All right. Hello, everybody. Um, so recall last lecture, we talked about the problem of evil. Um, so that's an argument that's purported to show that God does not exist. Now, we might wonder, okay, how might uh, uh, St. Augustine respond to such an argument, right? So um, Augustine has a lot to say about uh, free will and and free will uh the free will defense against the argument from evil is how he um lays out a lot of um is how he mainly responds to the problem of evil right so we have to wonder okay so god is perfectly good right so can perfectly good beings um allow some evils to occur Right. So here's a question. So we're going to pose three questions that are like three cases. So could a morally perfect mother say no to her child's request, even though saying no would be allowing an evil that she could have uh, prevented? For example, she could have prevented it by saying yes. So if, if you have children, um, you will probably uh, have the experience that the children will ask you for uh, uh, lots of things, right? So uh, mom, dad, may I have another piece of candy, right? Uh, at some point, they're gonna just keep asking for candy over and over and over again, right? At some point, uh, we might think that it's good to say no to the child, right? Um, well, why? Well, because maybe because eating that much candy is like bad for your health, right? And there's a good that the mother's trying to teach the child to, to obtain, right? Namely, uh, moderation and good health, right? So if you eat candy all day long, you're going to rot your teeth, you're going to get fat, you know, there's all so much sugar, right? All of these reasons not to just eat that much candy, right? Okay. So we might think that when the mother says no to the child, about the candy, the child's going to be upset. It's going to be uh, a, a he or she is going to be, it's going to pitch a fit, right? And, and, and that's because there's a kind of pain at not getting what it is that we desire, right? Okay, so the mother, by saying no to the kid, the mother uh, is causing the kid to suffer, right? Right. Okay. So, um, the idea here is that, look, I mean, if we have, we, we, we can have a, a morally perfect person, right? At least ideally, we could have a morally perfect person that, uh, that permits another person to suffer, okay? So, okay, so the, the, ch the child is suffering. Why? Because there's a greater good for the child to obtain, namely moderation and good health. Okay. Here's another question. Could a morally perfect doctor consent to treat a cancer patient with all the pain and suffering that necessarily goes along with such treatments, even though she could have prevented these evils, for example, by deciding not to consent to the treatments, right? Okay, so we have a doctor, we have a cancer patient, and the doctor says, look, I'm going to give you chemotherapy. But in virtue of giving you chemotherapy, you're going to suffer quite a lot, right? So the doctor is causing evil to the cancer patient. That's the idea here, right? Okay, so the doctor is administering pain to the cancer patient. Well, why? Well, because that's the road to the cure, right? That's how you get rid of cancer, but it also causes you a great deal of suffering. So we might wonder, okay, do you have to be like a morally evil doctor to administer suffering to another person, namely a cancer patient? No, it seems like you can be a morally perfect person, right? A morally perfect doctor and also consent to say, causing somebody to suffer. And that is because the doctor has a good reason, right? Okay, one more case. Could a morally perfect mother give her child a choice to do good or evil, even though she could prevent her child making an evil choice by not giving her a choice in the first place? So we might wonder, um, 
suppose it's the same little girl from the first case and she's older now and she says mother can i can i go out to the movies tonight right uh or go on a date uh maybe the mother uh, should, and, or, you know, a morally perfect mother could say, yes, you can go to the movies, right? Or you could go on this date. Uh, knowing that the child, that the daughter might do something that's evil, right? So, so it's a morally perfect mother doesn't necessarily always restrain uh, her daughter's uh, 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 range of choices that she might make, right? So, uh, the idea here is that um, sometimes a morally perfect being can allow somebody to do some evil and maintain their moral perfection or maintain their like moral status. Um, so a morally perfect mother can give a child a choice of whether or not to do evil. Um, but we might think that that the morally perfect mother could prevent that evil by not giving them that choice, right? But it, it also seems consistent to say that the morally perfect mother could allow the daughter to make her own decision, even though she could risk uh, making an evil decision. Okay, so we might wonder about the implications for the argument of evil. The idea here is that um, the idea here is that look, we we can have a morally perfect being that allows some evils to occur. Well, why? Well, because there's some goods that the morally perfect being is trying to get, and there's some necessary evil to get those goods, right? So it may not be the case that a morally perfect being will always um, prevent any evil that it can, right? So let's go back. Let's go back to the argument real quick. So we said an omnibenevolent being would prevent any evil it could prevent. But here are three cases where a morally perfect being uh, could allow some evil and, and will not prevent some evil, right? And that's because there's some better good that is attained in virtue of the evil. So the idea here is that, well, maybe God has some reason for allowing some of the evils in the world, right? Um, maybe every evil that that happens is allowed by God because there's some beneficial consequence that that comes about in virtue of the evil, right? And so if that's the case, then premise three might be false, right? So so this is one way in which Augustine or or sort of a uh, 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 Augustine inspired thinking um, might offer uh, might offer a response to the problem of evil. Um, so Augustine has a work called On Freedom of the Will, right? And in that work, he offers the substantive defense of having free will as well as um, why some, why bad things happen. And they happen a lot of the time in virtue of having our free will. But given that free will is so good, right, God lets us have it, even though, like, we can, like, cause some evils in the world. So anyway, so today we looked at three cases that are meant to show that, um, that are intended to show that, uh, <laughs> that God can allow some evils, right? So we concluded, right, that maybe premise three is false, right? We were, at least we entertained some evidence for thinking that premise three is false. And, uh, and this is the way in which Augustine likely would have uh, responded to the problem of evil.